Hello, everyone. I want to uh, give you a little bit of a summary sort of analysis of this article by Peggy McIntosh about white privilege. It's very famous. And um, I think the crucial thing I want to begin with is this. Um, is we're actually talking about creativity. And we've been talking about remixing, and we're now talking about appropriation. And what I'm interested in is the question of why some people take from others without thought. So this reading about privilege is really about thoughtlessness. It's about how people in the norm don't have awareness. They are oblivious they don't quite see what they're doing. And they certainly don't see how the system itself is helping them out and hurting people of, of different abilities or different race or different sex uh, by contrast. So I want to make sure everyone understands this is ultimately what I'm trying to do here is talk about how some people, because of privilege, take and remix other people's stuff thoughtlessly uh casually and one could argue in a in a in an oppressive way okay so and and key to that is not recognizing being oblivious to the world in certain respects and this is really difficult to talk about uh, in particular for people who are privileged because they have a hard time seeing it. So what I want to do is try to talk about why certain people have a hard time seeing their privilege. And also implicitly, I, I'm hoping you understand because certain people can't see their privilege, it, it makes it difficult for them to also see when they're in a power relationship and they're stealing or appropriating other people's culture. All right, so let's begin here. Most people use the word privilege in a very general way. They might say, oh, he comes from a wealthy family, so therefore he's privileged. Now, privilege does not simply mean you've got money, okay? It's about norms. So if you are white in this society, you are part of a norm. If you're able-bodied, you're part of a norm. If you're a Christian, you are part of a norm. So you can be, by the way, you can be privileged in certain ways. Maybe you're white and Christian, uh, but you can be marginalized in other ways. Maybe you're disabled. So I'm, I'm really, and if you want to do a real analysis of privilege, you'd have to talk about race and class and gender and ability, you'd have to look at all those things simultaneously, but it is entirely possible for someone to be privileged in one area and marginalized in another. Okay. So remember, privilege is not, first of all, about money. So I'm going to look at a passage. This is a passage uh, from the Peggy McIntosh essay, quote, it seems to me that obliviousness, obliviousness about white advantage, like obliviousness about male advantage is kept strongly enculturated in the United States, so as to maintain the myth of meritocracy, our whole bunch here. She says, I'm going to put it in my own words, she's saying that being Ignorant of how whites have advantage or ignorant of how men have advantage is socialized. Ignorance is socialized or built into us in order to, and we're talking about the United States, in order to strengthen or maintain this idea of meritocracy. Okay. Meritocracy is a very old American idea. It is that People who are rich, people that are privileged, got there on their own two feet. Now, we can both think uh, Donald Trump is a good example. 
Um, Donald Trump, oh, I'm going to butcher this, but uh, I believe his father gave him a million dollars when he came of age. That's an example of the opposite of meritocracy. Meritocracy is when you have nothing and you on your own as an individual create wealth, create inventions, become privileged simply through your own work. The system isn't helping you. Some family member isn't helping you. <laughs> Society is not helping you. No one's handing you a million dollars, but you do it all by yourself. And that, by the way, is a deeply American fantasy. So she's saying that this ignorance to advantage, white advantage or male advantage or Christian advantage or the advantage of ability is socialized and maintained and taught and repeated in this country so that the myth of people creating their own wealth, the myth of individualism, the myth of people uh, getting ahead on their own merits is maintained. Because if we said about, we have two presidential candidates right now, both of them are white men. Uh, both of them uh, say that they're Christian, right? If we said that they got ahead in our society because they're male, and we said they got ahead in society because they're Christian, what would be what would we be doing? We would be implying that they didn't get ahead because they're of their own brilliance, of their own hard work. And for many Americans, that is a slap in the face. They want to believe, Americans often want to believe that they got ahead on their own two feet and no one helped them. The rest of the quote says, uh, meritocracy, the myth that democratic choice is equally available to all. Keeping most people unaware that freedom of confident action is there for just a small number of people props up those in power and serves to keep power in the hands of the, hands of the same people that have most of it already. So, Behind this idea is individualism, individualism and individualism. And by the way, it's so in one way to, of thinking about politics is that uh, on the one hand, and Republicans tend to talk about individualism a lot. Uh, we could talk about politics in terms of do we emphasize individualism or do we emphasize community? And certainly liberals tend to talk about community and the system far more. Republicans will frequently say, hey, pick yourself up. It's your problem. You have the power to fix your problems. Democrats, the left will frequently talk far more about how if you're behind, if you're oppressed, if you're poor, if you're a drug addict or whatever, if you're marginalized in any way, they will frequently talk more about how the system is influencing you and the system needs to help you more. All right. You, that, that's a very basic way of thinking about the differences between the left and the right. So uh, to, to, to nail that down a little bit more, people don't like the idea of privilege because privilege says that people get ahead because of the system. White people get away, get ahead because there are a lot of whites being white is normal. Christians get ahead because being Christian is normal. Uh, people who are able-bodied get ahead because that's the norm. And no one, no one, no one likes to be told, hey, you only got ahead because the system helped you out. This is a, a deep attack on people on the level of pride. I mean, they're definitely macho alpha male types out there who take pride in their accomplishments and they want to believe and they want you to believe they did it all on their own. And the whole idea of privilege is that there, there are certain norms and those norms lift up certain people and push down other people. The system itself lifts up certain people. Um, so if you're white, if you're Christian, you're able-bodied in this country, uh, and if you're a man, you have a lot of things lifting you up and privileging you. So let's talk a little bit about race. Um, humans are really good about concrete things. In other words, very simple, concrete things are, are, are easy for us. 
Uh, so there's a guy named Dylan Klebold, and he killed 13 people at Columbine. You probably read about this maybe in your history books. Um, so someone like Dylan Klebold goes out, kills 13 people, and the neat, the tidy, the concrete way of saying, oh, uh, this is why this happened, this horrible thing happened, is to say, oh, he was mentally ill. As soon as you say that a mass shooter is mentally ill, that closes off the entire question of causality, or why did this person do that? If you say they're mentally ill, everyone says, ah, how horrible, and they stop thinking about it. However, if you say it was more complicated than that, then people have to keep on thinking. People don't want to think. They want to keep, they want simple, concrete, tidy answers. And the simple, concrete, tidy answer to school shootings is people are mentally ill. That means that society, the system, the community doesn't have to pay attention or do anything. Now, a systemic question, which is what privilege is about. Privilege is about how the system affects us. Um, Here's an example of a systemic question. How was Dylan Klebold's violence not merely the result of individual will, the product of society? Bullying, poor parenting, an obsession with natural selection. So, in other words, if we blame Dylan Klebold's violence on his mental illness, his individual mental illness, we're done talking. But if we start talking about Dylan Klebold in terms of maybe he was mentally ill because he was bullied by someone in society, or maybe he was mentally ill because of poor parenting. If we start thinking about how the system or society influenced the individual, all of a sudden we have big questions to think about. All of a sudden we don't have tidy answers. We actually have to struggle a bit. Uh, it makes us, it implicates ultimately a systemic question implicates society, and since we're all in society, it makes us feel guilty and forces us to struggle with the question of our own guilt. So here's another quote. Uh, is another quote from Peggy McIntosh's article. Uh, and she says, I've come to see white privilege. Now, remember, I'm really interested in privilege as an idea on multiple levels, right? And again, privilege in terms of this class is why is it certain people are so comfortable just stealing things or appropriating other cultures without thought and the reason is is there's a kind of 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 obliviousness a kind of ignorance right so she says that privilege is an invisible there's the obliviousness privilege is an invisible package of unearned assets that i can count on couch that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious, in other words, ignorant. White privilege, privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, pass passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. So let's look at some examples. Now, I'm trying to talk to you, just like Peggy McIntosh is trying to talk to her reader about something that is by its nature hard to see. Again, Dylan Klebold, he did those horrible things because he, he was mentally ill. That's simple and concrete. But as soon as I start saying it's society's fault, that opens things up. It's hard to be simple and concrete. The system, when you look at some big problem from a systemic point of view, from a social point of view, all of a sudden it's hard to see because it's so big. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. So examples of privilege. Uh, I'm going to show you three, and these are all from Peggy McIntosh's article on um, title is White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. So this is a famous example. Uh, used to be, and it's changed, probably because of Peggy McIntosh's article. You could buy Band-Aids, uh, let's say 20 years ago. You, you would go into the store and you would want to buy Band-Aids. And on the front of the Band-Aid container, it would say, uh, buy, would sell itself as being a flesh-colored Band-Aid. Well, flesh, that's all it said. It didn't say white. It didn't say brown or black or whatever. It just said flesh-colored. And guess what that meant? That meant white. So 
the packaging on a Band-Aid was so oblivious, so blind, forget the word blind, forgive me, so oblivious, so privileged that whoever created that, that Band-Aid package put flesh on it, they were so privileged, clearly white, that they had no idea that, oh yeah, I guess there are, they should have thought this, they should have thought, oh yes, I guess there are different colors of skin. But the, whoever created the Band-Aid uh, package was so privileged, they didn't, and, and clearly white, they didn't recognize that there are other colors out there. So privilege is being able to go to Rite Aid or Walgreens and buy Band-Aids that match your skin. <laughs> I mean, but in a very simple way. And that, if you could just take that example and explode it, it's a tiny example. But if you explode that by a thousand or ten thousand, and you start thinking about a million tiny, invisible ways in which white people or Christian people or straight people or uh, men are lifted up by society, you begin to get a sense of what privilege is. One small thing, like this one here, is not a big deal. But if you multiply it by ten thousand examples like this, you begin to see how society does help out certain groups at the expense of others. Uh, here's another simple example. Number 20, I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys, and children's magazines featuring people of my race. Absolutely. Um, I can, if I wish, to, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. Uh, at Wilberforce, where I'm currently teaching, uh, that's probably true. But in most contexts, I would say that's not true for African Americans. Um, so let's let's try to summarize this. Privilege is systemic. It's a system. It's social. And as a result, it's subtle, extensive, it's invisible. Privilege is created by those who define the norm. The norm, because it is so omnipresent, cannot be seen easily. This is really hard to explain. I, I want to make sure people understand that it's not like there are people in a room just who are defining the norm or creating privilege. In a way, privilege seems to be a product of norms generally. If you're part of a norm, and you could be, I, I guess... Uh, part of a norm in India, part of a norm in Congo or or uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, you know, it would be a very different norm. But you could theoretically be in a norm in those places, I would guess, and the same kind of dynamics would play out. No one's creating it. It seems to be a product of how when people see themselves as part of the norm, they unconsciously kind of become ignorant to the way their being and their life is, is supported by the system around them. I'm going to use, give you some more examples which might help you. Um, so, let me just stop with the slide. Um, And maybe end with two personal examples. I think I think I've been fairly clear now. Uh, I'm a white guy and Christian, uh, though in a complicated way, straight. I am, however, I however I am disabled, and however I grew up very very poor. All right, I see very very poor. My mother, single parent family. She was a nursing assistant. She never, you know, working class poor. So there are definitely areas in which I was lifted up and, and privileged. My whiteness, certainly the fact that I'm a male. But there are also ways in which I've been marginalized by society. I want to give you two personal examples. Uh, and uh, I want to preface them very clearly. Uh, one of them is, they're both example. One of them is, I don't even know if I want to call it racism. I'll give you the example and I'll try to explain it to you. Um, and this is all to go back to 
uh, trying to, to give you some additional examples connected with Peggy McIntosh. A long time ago, I was a grad student in East Lansing, Michigan, and I was at a bus station. I was standing near a woman, and she said to me, quote, and this is probably exactly the language because you don't forget this. She said to me, I hate your kind. Now, at that moment, I thought it was because of race. I'd done nothing. I was just standing there waiting for the bus. Uh, it could be she was African-American. It could be that she made that comment because I was white. It could be, in retrospect, because I was a student, maybe. It could be, in retrospect, because I was a man. I don't know. In retrospect, the, our country is so racially divided. I read it or understood that moment in terms of race at the moment, at that time. It could have been other things. It absolutely could have been other things. But from the standpoint, of, um, in terms of privilege, most of us see moments. Let's assume that was, in fact, about race. Uh, I did not ask follow-up questions. I just moved away and stayed my distance because I knew something was up, right? Um, if that was about race, most people would say, oh, that's an example maybe... They, they might say that's a pretty clear example of racism, okay? Privilege is not about clear examples of racism. Privilege is not about obvious examples of racism. We know, we know that racism is a major problem in this country, and certainly white people like myself have no reason to complain. I want to be clear about that. Racism is a major problem. We can see it, and we know clear, concrete examples of racism. Privilege, in terms of race, now remember we're talking about privilege in multiple ways. Privilege, you can, there, a, a system can be racist. A society can be racist in all kinds of invisible ways. And that's the kind of thing that privilege is trying to get us to think about. Privilege is a concept that's trying to get us to think about how we see an example of sexism. It's obvious, yes? We see clear examples of sexism, it's obvious. But do we see the million ways in which our country, our society, tends to privilege men at the expense of women? Probably not, probably not. Uh, I'm gonna give you one more example related to race. And you guys, will, some of you will find this amusing. Um, white folks, and this is one of Peggy McIntosh's point, if you're part of the norm and you're white, you can frequently go to church and surround by white people. You can go to a coffee shop and be surrounded by white people. You can go to, I don't know, the DMV and for the most part be surrounded by white people. <sighs> Seldom does the average Midwestern white person actually have the tables turned. In other words, seldom does a Midwestern white person end up at a place surrounded by African-Americans, okay? Doesn't happen. Now, I would guess that the opposite happens frequently. You could be African-American in this country and frequently find yourself in a position where you're surrounded by whites. Or you can be a woman and frequently find yourself in a meeting or in, in a setting surrounded by men. And that's gotta feel awkward, that's gotta feel uncomfortable. So I'm gonna give you an example of where I felt uncomfortable as a, um, as a white man a long time ago. This was, I was at Michigan State, same period of time. I was at Michigan State for seven years, so I don't know when this happened. It might have been years after the first event I described. And I went to an IHOP, uh, you guys know the restaurant, in Okemos, Michigan. And I went inside, and the entire restaurant was full of African Americans. I'm not sure. Now, you have to understand, I grew up in West Virginia, Parkersburg, West Virginia. Conservative, not nearly as diverse as I would have liked. But I go into IHOP, and everyone in the in IHOP appeared to be African-American. And it was also flooded. It was like, maybe there was a sorority meeting there. I don't know. But possibly for the first time in my life, I felt white. <laughs> now, what, what Peggy McIntosh is trying to get at is, if you're white, you frequently don't think about yourself that way. And she's trying to say that if you're not white, 
you frequently have to th you end up for you forced to think about your race. And again, we could be talking about sexism here. We could like talking be talking about ableism here. <sighs> frequently, someone who's in a wheelchair will have to be in a context where they have to think about themselves as being disabled. Able-bodied people don't go around thinking about themselves being able-bodied. All right, I think I've made my point. Privilege is being able to move around the world with ease and not being able to be and not being self-conscious about who you are. It's 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 having the world around you um provide you with things, make your life easier. Um allow you not to think as much. So privilege is about the system. It's not about racism in the sense or, or, or sexism or ableism in the specific sense of individual acts. It's about how the system or society as a whole in a million tiny ways that cannot be seen clearly lifts certain groups up and by lifting certain people up, pushes other people down. All right. So hopefully that helps. If you're privileged because you're kind of oblivious, because you don't understand the pain of people who might not be white or might not be Christian or might not be male, because you don't recognize how they might, how your behavior might be affecting them, you're much more casual in your appropriation or stealing or utilization of other people's cultures. Privilege is a kind of ignorance. Privilege is a kind of obliviousness. And that makes it far easier to remix other people's think the stuff or culture without thought. Okay, as always, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, send me an email, leave a comment, and I'm here for you. Just let me know.